here we are. Um, must apologize for the delay. It seems as though uh, something interrupted the transcription of this story, and uh, it took me a while um, to get back to it. It's now um, July 21st, like about two months after I started it. Sunday afternoon and a um, little time on my hands, so I thought I'd continue. To try to get back into the narrative, I played the other tape back and um, hopefully you can understand it. I won't uh, take any credit for being a professional transcriber or programmer. A couple items. When the Battle of the Bow started, I, I related about all these guns that were being fired by the Germans in their initial barrage. Now, uh, it might lead somebody to um, um, question, none of those shells or mortars or Panzerfaust were, were landing in our area. They were all going over my head, back in behind. They were softening up some other outfit and not aiming at us. Another thing, um, I have made reference to that map on page 471 in the time for trumpets. And um, at the time that um, the enemy tanks started coming into the rear area of our battalion area, um, we moved back through St. Vith. And um, so we were then uh, in an area on that map to the left of St. Vith uh, or west of St. Vith. Um, this was a break for us to get out of there. Uh, I say a break for us. Um, it's, uh, it's hard to explain. Um, but uh, there was some nasty, vicious fighting in that area that we so abruptly left. And um, a lot of people were killed at outfits, kicked around. And um, being on the west side, we were temporarily out of the war for a little while. Now, um, one of the things, uh, if you read this a Time for Trumpets, it... Uh, most of the close-in combat in World War II, they tried to make it armored vehicles, armored tanks, or even armored artillery. Now, of course, the old foot-slogging infantrymen accounted for an awful lot of the action. But um, it was not a normal hand-to-hand -hand combat operations or, or real close-in combat operations, I say, to have the guns like we were in. Uh, any good uh, field commander or, or uh, um, practicing, practicing um, good combat tactics of the World War II would try to keep those big heavy guns back behind the lines far enough so that they were not in any danger of being destroyed. We had no armor, no protection, and uh, normally weren't even trained to to protect our guns from, say, a tank attack or even an infantry attack. And um, uh, I suspect that Colonel White, our commanding officer, who, who I'm sure took it upon himself to order the, our unit out, was only following good standard practice in, in protecting those huge guns which could be so devastating if, uh, if they were used properly. But uh, we were devastating from like a half a mile or a mile away uh, up to as far as 17,000 yards was our maximum fire. And um, so the guns moved on back and in fact when I was talking to Vic Woodling on the radio and, and he asked me if I knew where to go, the, the area that our retrograde position was in was west of St. Vith. We had to go through St. Vith to get out of there. Now, St. Vith is a crossroads. There are a number of roads leading in and out of St. Vith. 
And when I started back towards St. Vith, between St. Vith and and where I left the 7th Armored Division, I ran into our Colonel White. He was in a jeep coming towards me. Off to the left down there, in the area of that railroad track, we had set up a, a place for, um, we could send our enlisted men for uh, two or three days rest and rec recreation, rest and recuperation, I guess you'd call it. Uh, a Sergeant Karbanovitz was in charge of that thing. And they called it Duffy's Tavern after a radio program of my generation back prior to World War II. Um, Colonel White was on his way back to alert that the personnel in Duffy's Tavern to get the hell out of there. When he, we stopped and talked to each other for a minute, and he said, uh, he first he asked if I knew where Duffy's Tavern was. Yeah, I said I just come by it. And he said, well, can you go back there? And I said, sure, I can go back there. He's, I remember he says, are you sure? And I said, absolutely, I just came from there. Well, he said, go back and tell Sergeant Carby to get out of there. Don't wait for him to leave. Just give him the message and tell him to get out as fast as he can and tell him to not wait to clean up any equipment or dishes or uh, cooking equipment or anything else. Get out of there. And uh, so I went back and gave Carby the message and the colonel turned around back towards St. Vith and I presume got through St. Vith and back up to the area where the guns were. Now this caused me a little delay, wasn't very long, half an hour maybe. By the time I got back to St. Vith, the road that I should have taken west out of St. Vith to the area that our retrograde position was in was designated as a one-way road going the other way. Combat units going into the fight from the west side of the St. Vith, going into St. Vith from there, and then on out the area I just left had top priority and, and I could not drive down that road. I took a road off to the right and um, um, it was getting later then. I suppose in about 4.30 or 5 o'clock and a terrible jam up of of all kinds of vehicles in St. Vith and in around St. Vith. And instead of going west, I went uh, like northwest. And um, somewhere up there along the line, there was a, an ordnance company that, that we had sent our guns up to to get calibrated. <coughs> now, the heavy guns that we were using, every time you fire a shell through them, it wears the tube. And after you fired, say, a dozen shells through the tube, why, you have a quite a little different wear on the tube, and it, the muzzle velocity drops quite rapidly on them. Uh, to properly fire those guns, you have to know what the muzzle velocity is, and, and uh, we'd, we'd routinely take one of those guns back at a time, and they'd fire it and, and measure the muzzle velocity, and, and also service the recoil mechanisms, and and just generally um, service that weapon. Um, I knew that they had facilities at this ordnance outfit for extra people. If we had a, a, a couple of guys go back with a truck or a, maybe there'd be as many as four or five go back with that gun. Maybe the crew chief and his gunner and, and uh, maybe a driver, an assistant driver. Pull that gun back there and they were there overnight while there was a pretty decent place to stay there, set up by this ordnance depot. I knew that, and bear in mind that I hadn't had any sleep the night before, and um, I, uh, I could have probably spent the night looking for my outfit back on further to the west of me, and, but this was too good an opportunity to stay overnight for myself and the two men with me. And um, so we stayed overnight there, and I remember the ordnance depot was quite concerned about what was going on, and and um, I've often wondered whatever happened to them. Uh, see, I was there overnight and never saw them again, never heard anything more about them. Um, the next day, I went back to the area that would have been our retrograde position, and there was nothing there. Our battalion had moved back there, 
and probably as quick as Colonel White got back there, they moved on back further on. Now, he probably by that time was in contact with Corps headquarters, and and they were um, uh, orienting the whole thing and, and directing the whole thing. And I know that I didn't get um, back to the outfit until later in that day, pretty pretty close to the end of the day. And I can't tell you what all I did. Um, might sound like I was goofing off, but I don't think I was. I was, I was trying to find the outfit, and uh, trying to find Corps headquarters who would know where the outfit was. But um, I remember pulling into the unit, and I saw Captain Holiday uh, from about a block away, just after I'd stopped in my jeep. And I remember he threw one arm up and hollered at me, Hey, buddy, I'm glad to see you. And I went on over and, and um, of course, uh, I was glad to see him. I was glad to be back. One of the things you didn't want to be is is separated from your unit for any length of time. And um, I think that as I left the shack um, that we had built up the other side of St. Vith, the night that I just got to sleep and then got rudely wakened up to go on out with the as liaison officer with the Seventh Armored Division, I had left this bottle of scotch I had on a box there, and and I think I asked Captain Holiday to take care of my bottle for me, at which he said he would. And uh, one of the first things he he told me when uh, when I saw him there uh, a couple of days later was, I've got your bottle. And I said, is there anything left in it? Oh, yeah, they hadn't drank too much of it, they said. Uh, some of the little things that you remember. Um, Captain Holliday, of course, was my immediate superior officer. I was under his personal command. And um, he was... Um, well, he was an extrovert, no question about that. Um, I don't think I ever saw him really down. Um, he he loved to wisecrack, and um, entirely different kind of a personality than my own. I'd go up to the OP and, and get shot at for three or four days, and maybe living under pretty rough conditions, if you especially in the wintertime. Uh, this was not necessarily when I was up there in that German pillbox. That was a good deal. A lot of times you're sleeping on the ground and, and moving around and and uh, you're getting shot at all the time and, and you just don't don't rest very well. You're on the alert all the time and, and um, so I'd get called back for a few days relief. Uh, somebody else would take my place. And I remember a number of times when I was going back, I, I was really kind of depressed and I, I, I didn't recognize it as such uh, nearly as much then as I, I do now in retrospect. But um, I'd get back and here'd be half holiday and and he'd probably start wisecracking. And I know at first it'd kind of annoy me but pretty soon he'd have me worked out to where I was laughing a little bit and then we'd get into a bridge game and and uh, he was talking all the time and having a little fun. He was a he was a damn good man to be around and I de developed a tremendous affection for him. Uh, we all did. He was one of the most popular officers in the unit and um, we had lots of fun together in lots of ways. Um, I can't really remember too much more about the Battle of the Bulge. Somehow or other, those early days stick out in my memory. After that, we were moving around and and we didn't get into anything that amounted to much. We mostly were on the move, moving back away from these advancing Germans. And a couple of times we, we lined up to get into position to fire uh, to support some American unit and wham bang the Germans would make an advance and damn near overrun us and we'd move back again. Um, their weather was terrible. After that first day that I was out with the 7th Armored Division, it fogged in and closed in. Uh, it was snowing and raining and low overhanging clouds and and um, 
this of course was a major factor because our uh, American Air Force could not operate at all when they weather finally cleared and and they went out in force um, that was really something to behold but that was a long towards probably about the day before Christmas that I, I remember it turned off clear there'd been a lot of snow and this was more back towards I think back west of Hoofalize, but uh, again, I'm kind of guessing. Maybe even west of Bastogne, but I guess Hoofalize would be northwest of Bastogne. Anyway, um, I remember that the unit was supposed to go into position in an area that I would think now would have been north of Bastogne. I was detailed into Bastogne to, to um, maintain liaison with the 333rd Field Artillery Group and the 8th Corps Headquarters. They were actually uh, almost synonymous right then. They were right together. Again, I, um, I had my radio and was trying, they were, the b battalion was supposed to move into an area that I could reach by radio from Bastogne and um, I was going to contact them by radio and I failed to contact them and finally got permission to leave there and uh, go look for my unit and um, permission was granted and I got out of there. Um, I think I got out about three o'clock in the afternoon and and I think that was the last day that the people in Bastogne were not surrounded by German troops. Um, I, I, you see, at the time I didn't know they were going to be surrounded or that they later on the next day or two were, but in trying to reconstruct the thing, why well, I figured that I got out just a matter of hours before they really shut the gates all the way around, had them completely surrounded, and, and if, if that had happened, I would have probably been there until they were relieved by the, uh, what was it, the Ninth Armor or Third Armor that finally got in, Patton anyway, got in and relieved them. I remember that afternoon in leaving, um, I think we were going north out of Bastogne. And um, again, um, my, my memory is not that good and I was constantly confused about directions in there. I, I never really got lost because we always had excellent maps of the area. But just which direction I took to get out of Bastogne that particular afternoon I don't know but uh, I had this little ex Nevada horse jockey who was my Jeep driver was the best driver I ever had a hold of and uh, we're tooling down a road out of Bastogne maybe a couple of miles and and we topped up over a little hill and off to my right about uh, oh 40 feet off the road and coming toward me was a Mark IV Tiger tank, and um, I saw it, my driver saw it at the same instant. Neither one of us said a thing. He just made a dive for the left-hand side of the road and at the same time broke that thing down to a stop. Um, had no more stop than he had in reverse and backed up and swinging his wheels and around to the side and in just another movement he had the thing going the other way again we had turned around there in about four seconds flat he was a damn good driver I'm watching the tank and they swung their muzzle of their gun over towards us they had seen us and and uh, by the time their gun swung over we were going away from them and we were going a lot faster than they were that kid could really make that Jeep jump and um, I watched the tube of that, I suppose, an 88. And um, I couldn't say exactly what the nomenclature of the tank was, but I suspect it was a Mark IV Tiger, a very common tank for the Germans. And um, I swear that I could see the projectile leave the muzzle of that thing heading towards us. Um, it didn't particularly uh, frighten me. 
you, you don't have time to be frightened. Um, we were moving so fast it had been, a, we were a terribly hard target then, although we were moving more or less directly away from him. But that, that shell missed us by quite a long ways. And it went to the left of us because it, it hit in the ditch of the road just well in front of us and, and was well spent by the time we come dashing through the thing. And, and I know we went through the smoke of the shell that exploded in the left ditch of the road as we went by. And then we're over another hill and away from him. The thing then we had to do was find a different road, to go where we wanted to. The Germans were depriving us of the use of that road. And uh, which we did. There were a lot of roads in that area, and and I had been in and out of the area before the Battle of the Bulge ever started. For some reason or other, I guess we had a a better than average knowledge of the road network in that area. Of course, bear in mind that we'd been there for a couple of months, and I went on down to the area that our guns were supposed to be in. It was near a village. The village was absolutely deserted. There wasn't a soul anywhere. And that's always bad. You're usually, if you run into a situation like, situation like that, you're, you're caught between the, the German forces and the American. And, uh, but I satisfied myself that our guns were not there. Then I, I proceeded to go on further north. Again, uh, there was an area up there that they'd used for an ammunition dump, and I guess I'd been up there somehow or other, and I can't remember, but um, somewhere along the line, uh, somebody decided that I should have a 50 caliber machine gun on my Jeep. It was mounted. The mounting was between the front seat and the back seat and the thing in the floorboards there, and, and um, we usually carried it with the muzzle forward, and that went right up between the, the driver and the off-driver passenger. Um, I had more or less a permanent detail and a little guy by the name of Macintosh, quiet, rather timid sort of a guy, and um, very faithful. He'd do anything you told him to. And, and um, one of the things I didn't want to have happen was to have that damn 50 caliber machine gun and after having it a month or two, have some colonel or general officer inspect the damn thing and find that it had picked up some rust. That is just the worst thing that could happen to a first lieutenant in the field artillery. And so I told Macintosh to polish that damn thing and keep it clean. And he had been oriented enough on 50 caliber machine guns so that he could break it down and clean it up and oil it and put it back together again. And and uh, did a damn good job. I inspected it myself periodically. And, and uh, But on this particular trip, we'd never had any occasion to even take the cover off the barrel. It had a long canvas cover that you slipped over the barrel that protected it from the weather. And, and uh, But after running into that German tank, it alerted us a little bit more than usual. And, and we laid the windshield down, and as we topped up over a hill, if it was a hill you could see a ways, why well, we'd top up just gradually and even stop with just our heads breaking defilade and kind of look things over. And uh, we did this on one particular hill, and I, of course, had excellent field glasses. And, and I noticed some activity on the road down ahead of us, and, and I watched it. Sure enough, it was German foot soldiers and they had cut a couple of trees down and were putting a roadblock in. And after watching them a little while, why I realized that they were blocking the road, not from the way we were coming, but from the opposite direction. I think this was a, we were on a road going west, and they were blocking it on, on American troops coming from the east, from the west going east, see, the opposite direction we were going. Uh, which spells something. Uh, we were behind the German lines. Now, um, this is not so unusual. Uh, at different times, probably half the American combat army was behind the German lines because the lines were so loosely drawn in that Battle of the Bulge. But anyway, um, 
I said, Mac, I said, unlimber that machine gun and give those guys a working over down there. I thought that after all the work he'd done polishing that machine gun and oiling it and cleaning it, that he would be uh, real eager to try it. And um, he looked at me just as uh, kind of forlorn as could be, gosh, Lieutenant, he said, I wish you'd do it. And um, of course, that was a challenge to me. And I said, well, get the hell out of the way. Let me get back there then. And, and um, we loaded up that machine gun and opened up on, I don't know what there was, eight, 10 or a dozen German soldiers working down there on that roadblock. And, and um, I know that uh, my initial rounds were way closer to my side of them than they were. I, I, my, I was shooting short wasn't hitting them at all and I raised it up to where there was those tracers were bouncing around in their area and they certainly disappeared and we've I give them a, about a bucket of ammunition and and uh, then we closed her up and put the cover back on the gun and backed up and went back towards the north again on that particular time we I, I traveled past this ammunition dump place and um, we were we were getting further and further away. We traveled quite a ways, and you can make a hundred miles pretty easy in a jeep, you know. And and here we'd been going since three o'clock, and by that time it was oh, like six thirty-seven, dark as could be, and we were following this road. By that time, we went north and then west, if if I've got it correctly. Anyway, uh, finally, lo and behold, here we come to a, a military police. Uh, sentry and I got some information from him uh, I asked him about 8th Corps headquarters and he said he thought they were in Verdun that's back into France and that's where we headed for we had uh, an unusual experience there um, we got into Verdun and I don't know how big a place that would be um, a small city I suspect but it was just alive with with military vehicle traffic and the streets were just loaded with GIs and I I uh, I had the Jeep and the driver and this radio operator the three of us and and uh, black out everything there wasn't a light showing anywhere but you got so you could see a little bit you, I could tell there was a crowds of people on the sidewalk and by this time we're hungry again and we don't have any any food with us and so um, I stepped off on the sidewalk and practically ran into a guy I uh, uh, he loomed up in the dark in front of me and I knew it was a man and a helmet steel helmet on and I said say soldier I said you don't know if there's a transient mess or quarters around here do you a transient mess would have been a kind of a free-for-all fed anybody that come along and um, the guy said is that you lieutenant Stegner and it was major chestnut from our outfit he had gone back into Verdun to meet with uh, some general uh, who was trying to coordinate the artillery in the area and and um, I had run into him uh, hundreds and hundreds of people there in Verdun and the uh, first guy that I happened to ask was Major Chestnut. I was just completely bowled over. We uh, we um, waited for his conference with the general and and I think about 10 o'clock we moved out and tried to stay together and had a lot of trouble traveling together because my driver was so much more efficient than his that we kept losing him and I remember he got a little short-tempered about it and, and uh, we eventually about I don't know two thirty three o'clock in the morning got back to the battalion area and um, so help me I don't know what we did from then on my my detailed memory stops right there and of course eventually we gained a lot of semblance of order uh, in the combat of the battle and then we started advancing and kicking the Germans ahead of us and we went back more to our routine warfare that we had practiced all the way from the English Channel. 
Um, that um, pretty well, I guess, covers the my experiences of the Battle of the Bulge. And um, we eventually got back into the same area that we'd been kicked out of, and I was on the same OP overlooking the city of Prum, and um, we we recovered the two guns that the sea battery had destroyed and um, took them down to ordnance and ordnance put new tubes on them and we went right back to using them um, the Germans uh, hadn't done a thing with them nobody had even touched them as near as we could tell um, we were we were uh, observing the battle to take prom when we got an order that took us completely out of the area of the Battle of the Bulge. Actually, we were we were ordered back to Maastricht, Holland, and then um, east from there in a, in, a, in an operation that was uh, then to cross the Ruhr rivers, that uh, the famous Ruhr rivers that they were talking about in the a time for trumpets of the dams that that uh, were up above. The Germans eventually blew those dams and flooded the area down below, which slowed the American army up, I don't know, two, three weeks. But um, as far as I'm concerned, that was the end of the Battle of the Bulge for us. I did have one other experience that stands out in my mind. On uh, the 24th of December, um, fairly early in the morning about um, um, oh, 8, 9 o'clock, Colonel White called me in and you see I was um, I was really um, only busy when we were in combat and firing the guns if, if it was so, the situation was so confusing that that we didn't have our guns in position to fire and didn't know when we would have why well, I was kind of an extra officer, nothing much to do. Uh, I was attached to headquarters battery and um, under Captain Holiday, but uh, had no routine duties, so to speak. Of oh, they always found something to do. But um, during World War II, it was the officer's duty to to read all of the enlisted men's outgoing mail and censor it, be sure they weren't violating security somewhere. And uh, Captain Holiday and Jim Regner would, I think, save a lot of that mail for times when I would be back in the battery, and I, I think I got more than my share of, of um, censoring mail. That gets to be a real um, kind of a chore, tedious chore. And um, along those lines, you could... Um, I could comment. Um, we had a few guys that uh, didn't um, pay too much attention about uh, being so truthful in their letters. One guy who was attached to headquarters battery, and bear in mind that headquarters battery would normally be quite a ways behind the lines. And um, only rarely did they ever get any um, action in headquarters battery. I think uh, one time we, right after we landed in France, we had a a uh, German airplane that had tried to strafe the headquarters and and I suppose there were times when an occasional artillery shell would reach back to us, but it wasn't very often. Um, but this guy would regale his family in his letters with how he was in a tent and an artillery shell went through one side and out the other and and hair-raising experiences, all of which were not true. Well, that raised a question, what what do you as a censor, uh, what responsibility should we take on that? And we finally decided we'd let them tell anything they wanted to as long as it didn't uh, possibly implicate us with the Germans, in case the Germans got a hold of that letter. Uh, uh, as long as it didn't violate military security, why well, we let them do whatever they wanted to. And that same guy, the one I'm thinking about, oh, about the time the, the war was practically won, I think into April or somewhere, just before Hap Holiday was killed, he uh, took it upon himself to crawl into a 
double the shelter aft, one of those little, little pup tents, and, and took a 35 caliber rifle with him and put the muzzle in his mouth and kicked the trigger and committed suicide. Now, uh, it's hard to understand what that poor guy was thinking about. But uh, he was one of the guys that was constantly prevaricating and, and telling what a hell of a rough life he was having. And, and actually, he would spend most of his time on as KP in the headquarters battery kitchen at his own request. He had volunteered for that. But as I say, um, uh, most of the time when, um, when we weren't in a position to fire, I was uh, without too many duties. And the colonel called me in this morning of December 24th, and we hadn't had any mail since the, the um, Battle of the Bulge had started. And uh, my orders from him were to go find the 8th Corps headquarters and find our mail and uh, don't come back without it. And I took a, a three-quarter ton weapons carrier, a good-sized pickup, and and um, I think it was either Verdun or another French town on the river da back there that I finally found our mail, and I found it about uh, dark of the night of the 24th, Christmas Eve. And there they had a big transient mess, a huge tent with a big kitchen crew. And um, I remember they had a mess sergeant who was a big, heavy set fellow, terribly profane. Um, now, it was my experience in the Army, if you found a, a heavy set, overweight mess sergeant, you usually had a good mess. The guy liked to eat, and he liked food, and uh, applied himself. This was the case in this, in this deal. And, I went in there and they were already roasting turkeys for the Christmas Day dinner the next day. And um, I said, Sergeant, I said, uh, there wouldn't be any way you could uh, kind of slice off a little side of one of those turkeys for my driver and me here, could you? And I said, um, told him where we'd come from, the other side of St. Vith, and how we'd been in combat all the time through the Battle of the Bulge, and by this time the Battle of the Bulge was getting quite a lot of notoriety. And uh, I remember he started to swear, and he said, the colonel, he said, told me not to give anybody any turkey. And here I get a guy like you, and how the hell am I going to say no? He said, come on back here where they won't see you, and he said, I'll give you some turkey. I had told him we were leaving to go right back out the front, and we wouldn't probably have any turkey there. So he slammed off a big chunk of turkey for my driver and me, and we really put it away. And what I had done was make arrangements to stay overnight there. And the next morning, we gets up early before daylight, and I go back, and there's a different crew in that same kitchen. And I give him the same story. We didn't, of course, tell him that the sergeant had been good enough to give us all the turkey we could eat the night before. We got all the turkey we could eat for breakfast. And um, so we immediately started back and and we got back to the the headquarters battery about um, oh I guess about three o'clock in the afternoon just in time to to uh, sit in on a Christmas dinner with them they had uh, somehow or other drawn turkeys after I left and then stayed up all night to roast them and we had a hell of a good uh, turkey dinner, and in fact, I had three Christmas turkey dinners that year, <laughs> which, uh, um, of course, took out in my mind. It's easy to remember things like that. Some of the more important things, it's hard to remember. But uh, that's the way it was. Somewhere along the line, that same year, and I can't remember just where it was, but... Um, Hap Holiday got a package in the mail from his brother, and that must have been a, I don't know, eight or ten pound fruitcake, an immense huge fruitcake. And uh, of course, um, as close as I was to Hap and as generous as he was, why well, I think I ate as much as he did. And um, 
I don't recall anything in uh, the whole war in Europe that, uh, as far as packages from home, it was more appropriate. Um, it shipped well and was delicious when it got to us and really hit the spot. Um, Hap was uh, terribly generous and um, um, just a all-around good fellow. He he was very popular with his men. Um, I suppose uh, a good many people got a, a slice of that fruit cake. And uh, um, looking back, I think perhaps I was a little bit in awe of him. Um, uh, possibly because of the education that he had. Uh, I um, had been grown up on a farm and sheep ranch in uh, southwestern North Dakota and um, at a time when it was difficult uh, to get to a high school. Um, I finished the local one room, one teacher, uh, schoolhouse, eighth grade. Uh, I went through that in five years. Uh, my mother had taught me to read before I ever started school and so I found it really easy in the grade schools and uh, graduated when I was 11 years old. My father had decreed that I was too young to go away from home to go to school and and um, I eventually got to um, one room, one instructor high school for about seven months one year. I stayed out a year and then went to high school a year, stayed out another year and went back to Minnesota to a boarding school that was uh, primarily for farm kids through the um, University of Minnesota and uh, went through two different winters there. That was a six month deal and so after I was 11 years old and finished the eighth grade I got a total of about 19 months in school. Never finished high school, of course, and uh, I somehow or other uh, it gave me a, a little bit of an inferior complex on these guys that had finished good school like your father had, and and um, probably was just as well uh, for me. Uh, uh, but he was a very confident guy. Uh, confident of his own ability and uh, without being egotistical at all and um, just a very capable officer. Um, he uh, he had no fear of the enemy. Uh, he figured we could take care of him anytime we turned around and and um, pretty good thing but um, uh, of course we'll never know uh, what, I, what I'm thinking of is that his attitude might have uh, got him killed. Um, certainly, um, you can be proud of him. Um, and I thoroughly enjoyed him. Um, as, um, as the war was winding down, um, one thing, <laughs> it seemed as though I was away from the unit a lot as we got ready to go overseas and one thing and another. But um, some officer gave all of the officers in our outfit an orientation lecture about overseas service and combat and, and said they wouldn't need any money and suggested that they, they allot all of their pay except for about $5 a month to their home in the States. Well, all of these guys did that and I uh, missed that orientation and so I didn't know enough to. I was getting about thirty dollars a month. So I always had more money than any of the rest of the fellows. And um, so, um, being up front that way, we frequently ran into um, either we took a few prisoners ourselves, or we were close to where the infantry took them, and we'd frequently get close to this matter of taking German prisoners and. And uh, being close to the to the front that way, we were close to the people that took them, as I say. And and uh, I was always acquiring uh, different uh, German loot, primarily pistols. 
I think I had about eight pistols. They weren't all German, but I know I had three Lugers, and your father wanted a Luger, and I had one that was just absolutely mint condition. Now, um, we had a lot of fun uh, jockeying about that Luger, and um, of course he never knew it, and I can say anything I want to, but uh, I'll assure you that he would have acquired that Luger under any kind of circumstances if we'd left together to go home. I had reserved that for him. I was trading Lugers and stuff with other people, but that one was for half holiday, and of course I kept asking him for more trade. I was going to trade it to him, but uh, um, just a few days before he was killed, he had been going forward with the advance party that way he was on the trip that he got killed on.